Our gospel reading comes from the gospel of Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, put it, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is a plethora of resources, books, commentaries, scholarly articles about the Sermon on the Mount. And many of them have this topographical kind of map that they put. And so I have included one of those on the back of your bulletin that gives the imagery literally of the mountain and what is said and how it's said and what it all points to. And ultimately, everything points to the Lord's Prayer, which I find very interesting. But there is a starting point, ascent, the blessings, the law and the prophets, and we'll talk a little bit about that this morning. And then there's the six words, we'll talk about that next week, and then giving the Lord's Prayer. And then on the other side, the descent is a mirroring almost of the ascent. Um, and so in some of my research this past several weeks, the two questions at the bottom of that triangle came to my vision, which I it's not something that I hadn't been aware of, but I hadn't been asked it quite so pointedly. How do you read scripture? Do you read it like a dictionary or like an encyclopedia? And I thought, well, I don't know. And what difference does it make? Well, it makes a huge difference, actually. A dictionary is simply words in relationship to other words. Whereas an encyclopedia is words in relationship to the cultural context and language from which they come. And our words cannot be severed from the language in which they are created and the context in which they are created. Think about some of the words that we have in this day and age that may have changed meaning, meaning over the last 100 to 150 years, or perhaps some words that we have now that we never had in our language before. Uh -huh, there's giggling going on back here. I, I, have, I have a wooden ox yoke in my office. And I, you know, for, for many of us, and it's particularly those of us in church, when we think of a yoke, Often we think about being yoked with Jesus or yoked with our spouse and that image. But most people, when you talk about a yoke, they're going to think about the yellow part of an egg. Okay? So language and words cannot be severed from their culture. And so when, when I read this text, there's a couple of things that I had to really look at. One, what was salt and light for the people who heard these words from Jesus? And also, what, what literally was the law and the prophets that Jesus is talking about when he says, I have come to fulfill the law? 
It's not just the Ten Commandments or that 613 rules and regulations in Leviticus. It's the, it's the early story of human history and their relationship with God as found in those first five books of the Bible. And so when I hear law, I need to think about when Jesus is talking about that, that means, that means our relationship with God and how we as humans were never going to be able to be reconciled back to God by what we did. It took God through Jesus being born into the world and Jesus becoming that perfect sacrifice that generous and gracious offering because no matter what sacrifices and offerings we made we were not going to figure out how very much God loves us and so Jesus has fulfilled all of the law and the prophets I did not blow that out it has just gone out and so now we have one light left on the altar table so when we get to that, hopefully that one won't go out. But think about, think about the culture that, that thousands of years ago when, when the stories were written, when God's word was made real, and how Jesus has now fulfilled that because he has become for us the sacrifice, the offering, the one who has reconciled us back to God. And that's important because our human story, our human and divine relationship, that has to be reconciled because God longs for us to be his and to know that we are his and to know how much we are loved. And so then if we go back to the blessings of salt and light, for us, salt is what we use to season our food or perhaps to preserve, particularly if you're pickling in the summer. Maybe it's what we put on our driveway or our sidewalk when it ices. But at Jesus' time, when he's calling folks to be salt, it has very little to do with food. Well, not in the way that we think about food. Let's put it that way. You see, it was the daughter's task in the home to go and collect animal dung and to mix it with salt and then to pat it out into patties because that was the fuel for the family ovens. Now, I don't know about you, but the thought of dung fueling an oven and then baking something in that oven sounds just a little bit strange. They still do it that way. They still cook that way in the, in the center of the village with the oven outside that the family uses together. And so salt is the combustible agent to be able to burn the dung, the dried dung. And yet, if it has lost its saltiness, then the dung does not burn, and therefore it is useless. I still can't get past the idea of cooking food in fuel that is dung, but that's what they did, and that's what they needed to do. And then there's light. So you have salt that brings forth light, and then you have the candle, the oil lamp on a lamp stand. And how important th both of those pieces are so that in being salt and light, we are the representation of God's presence. God's presence in our lives, and then more importantly, God's presence in the world. We are called to be salt and light for the world. When I was um, teaching an adult Sunday school class many years ago, it didn't occur to me that the Sunday school classroom was in the basement of the church. 
And I was doing the piece where Jesus talks about, I am the light of the world. And so I had prepared, giving everyone one of those little candles to hold. We had talked about the scripture. I went to the door and I flipped off the light switch, not anticipating the complete and total darkness that we would find ourselves. Thank goodness I had the matches in my hand. And when I striked just that one little tiny insignificant match, we all breathed a little easier. We knew there was light in the darkness. And so I lighted my candle, and that was even better than the match. And then I lighted the first person's candle, and as it went around the circle, much like on Christmas Eve when we light our candles, it's amazing how it takes just a little bit of light in the midst of darkness to illumine. And how important that is. How to illuminate things is important. On Friday, William and I headed to Nashville to go to the symphony. And driving down I-40, which I can do almost in my sleep. I've done it so many times. I don't, I promise. (laughs) But driving down I-40, which is a very familiar road for me, Coming down Monterey Mountain, I became a little bit disoriented because I thought, where am I? Between the grayness of the snow and the sky and the fog, I thought, where am I? Where am I on this very familiar stretch of road? And then I realized what was happening was I was seeing things in the landscape that I don't normally see. You know how on Friday the, the snow had, had laid across the top of every single twig on every branch? Well, it had also laid across barns of, in the field and roofs of houses and bales of hay. And suddenly through the snow-covered forest going down Monterey Mountain, I could see farmland and barns that I normally never see because of the way the landscape is. But everything was illuminated by that dusting of snow. Jesus illuminates. He's illuminated the gift of the law and the prophets because he has fulfilled it, because he became what was needed to reconcile us back to God. And in illuminating that for us, then we are called to illuminate that for the world, to illuminate that that God is still with us and how God lives in us and then to be able to help folks see how God lives in them because that's not something that we articulate very well or very often, to be able to share our story and then to help others see that same story in themselves. But as salt, as the combustible agent in a world of dung, yeah, I said it, (laughs) it's important for us to have that, to be able to say to the world, it's not as bad as the world would have us believe, that God is here that God's with us, that God is still in charge, and that the light that I have is the light that you have, and the light that you have is this light here, and that through that light we can illumine the very presence of God, which the world so desperately needs to hear. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may the people of God say, Amen.